In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. As always, it's great to be with all of you. And today we'd like to, as always, start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary has uh, many beautiful titles. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is also the mother of each and every one of us. We also cry out to Mary as she is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's say the, that prayer that Mary loves most. And that prayer is the Hail Mary. Let's turn to Mary and ask her to accompany us in our conversation this morning. As we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now let's ask our spiritual director to be with us. What a great privilege it is, it is to have as our spiritual director the Holy Spirit. What a great privilege. So let's uh, turn to the Holy Spirit as we get to know him better as the, the paraclete. He's also known as the gift of gifts. The Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of the soul. Holy Spirit is also known as the our interior master or teacher. St. Paul says that we really don't know how to pray as we ought. But good news, the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba. We can say Abba, which means Daddy or Father. <clears throat> So let's invoke the Holy Spirit and beg the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light, light in our intellect. Let's also pray for the fire of divine love to burn within our hearts. As we pray the traditional prayer to the Holy Spirit that hopefully we're, we're getting to learn. And that prayer is, come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Paul Andrew, and companions, the Korean martyrs, pray for us. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. Saint Francis Xavier, pray for us. Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. 
In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. It's true, my friends, the family that prays together stays together. So we always start off our day by praying together. Praying together. Then I promise to pray for you in the Mass that I'll be celebrating today. Today I'll be celebrating the Mass at midday at 12 noon. And I'd like to place all of you and your intentions on the altar right now. Right now. No greater prayer, no greater prayer in the whole world than the holy sacrifice of the Mass. What a privilege it is, my friends, to be Catholics and practicing Catholics as I'm sure you are. Because we have the 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 we um the treasure of infinite value the pearl of great price which is the holy sacrifice of the mass and of course the eucharist so we run out we want to be thankful for the fact that we have the holy sacrifice of the mass and i'd like to place all of you on the altar in my first intention is that we would be docile and open we would be docile and open to the workings of the Holy Spirit that's right we'd be docile and open to the workings of the Holy Spirit We might say this short prayer during the course of the day. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. That's right. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. So let's be open to the workings of the Holy Spirit. He will send us a lot of inspirations today if we're open. Well, let's try to respond generously with what he invites us to do for him. My second intention will be, I'd like to pray for you, your families. Last night I gave another class of formation and I told the parents that uh, with respect to your confirmation kids and children, you are the first teachers of the children. Not the school, nor politics, nor the social media. You're the first teachers of children in all, but especially in the realm of faith, are you the parents? For that reason, we come together every morning and later on in YouTube, for those who cannot follow me live, for the purpose of getting, know the word, getting to know the Word of God, but also that we will be able to get to know our faith better, our Catholic faith better, and not keep that faith to ourselves, but share that faith with others starting with her own family members, starting with her children. Last night I gave a talk on Christ, on getting to know Christ by the Christological titles, the different titles we have in the Bible for Christ. And they told the parents that of the, all the names of Christ, Jesus is the most important name, and it means Savior. The Archangel Gabriel said that his name is Jesus because he will save the people of their sins. And they told the people that we used to be taught by the nuns and by our good parents that at the name of Jesus to bow your head to bow your head in reverence. St. Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. 
in the heaven, on earth, and even below the earth at the name of Jesus Christ. At the name of Jesus, may every knee bend. The great reverence that we should show toward the holy name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My last intention will be, I'd like to pray in a special way, my friends, as always, with you. I'd like to pray for the conversion of sinners. Especially, I'd like to pray for the conversion of deathbed sinners. I mean, so today, there will many, many people in the world will die. Many will die today not being aware of the fact that this will be their last day. Jesus says that he'll come like a thief in the night, like in the time of Noah. So Jesus constantly exhorts us to be prepared because we know neither the day nor the hour. So those will be my intentions I'd like to offer for you on this day, placing you on the altar lifting you up on high. So I'd like to do, my friends, as yesterday, is I'd like to go through some of the Proverbs. And then the Gospel today is very short but very dense in meaning. So I'd like to jump down to um, some of these Proverbs and explain them. We've already jumped to chapter 21, so the church is just giving us a, uh, a few of the Proverbs that we can meditate upon. Okay, the first I'd like to meditate upon with you is, it says, to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. All right, how do we know, my friends, what is right and just? Well, my friends, it's by getting to know the commandments. That's right getting to know the commandments. The Lord will go on to say, not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my heavenly Father. Then Jesus will go on to say, my food is to do the will of my Father. And our Lord will also say, that if you love me, keep my commandments. So the acid test for us in doing what is right and just in the eyes of God is to keep the commandments. You'll probably remember the passage of the rich young man. The rich young man runs up to the Lord and says, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, Obey the commandments. So we might go through the commandments today and, and ask ourselves, are we obeying the commandments? Pray for us because this week in confirmation, we're going to be preparing the confirmation students to make a good confession. Many of them have probably not, have not made confessions, maybe in years, especially those in the first year. So we want to Teach them to do what is right and just by forming their conscience so that they can confess their sins and experience the love and mercy of Christ. Let's move on to another proverb. These proverbs are very rich, aren't they? Very rich. <coughs> Following proverb is haughty eyes and a proud heart. The tillage of the wicked is sin. 
So what the proverb is inviting us to do is not to become proud. Rather to be humble. That was the last proverb yesterday. What is humility? It's the opposite virtue of pride. A humble person recognizes that all of the evil he does is his own. Whereas all the good that I can do, all the good that you can do in this life, is a result of God's grace in our lives. That's right. All the good I can do is should be attributed to God. For that reason, when, when someone compliments you on something, you, someone compliments you on some good work you've done, I think it's a good idea right away to reflect the glory to God and say, thanks be to God. Maybe get in the habit. People compliment you on your good work, work your, your cooking, your talents, your eloquence, whatever it might be. Then reflect the glory to God. As the psalm says, not to us, not to us, but to God, to him be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We really want to give the honor and glory to God. These Proverbs are very rich, aren't they? Very rich. Then the following is, the plans of the diligent are sure of profit. The plans of the diligent are sure of profit, but all rash haste leads certainly to poverty. That's a pretty good proverb. Let's uh, let's go backwards. I remember I was once in Chile and there was a uh, Spanish priest that would celebrate the mass in the cathedral and once or twice I can celebrate with him and the altar servers the altar servers were rushing they were hurrying they're in haste and remember the Spanish priest said said to them slow down I'm in a hurry wow Slow down, I'm in a hurry. What did he mean by saying to the altar servers, slow down, I'm in a hurry? Well, I think he was saying this, is that if the altar servers were going to be rushing in haste, they'd probably make mistakes there in the sacristy and even there on the altar. So I think the proverb is saying this. Better to prepare and do a work calmly with time than to in a very pre to precipitate to rush into the work and then do it poorly in other words better to do better to to do our work calmly orderly methodically systematically and peacefully than to rush into it and have to do it over again. Give me an example. If you read the life of St. Charles Borromeo, he was made the Secretary of State even before he was a priest. His uncle was the Pope. And he had two degrees of law when he was very young. And it said that he, he did the work of, he was able to do the work of three or four persons. Because St. Charles Borromeo was close to God, but he worked orderly, methodically, and systematically. 
Would you consider yourself when your your type of work is is orderly done orderly, methodically and systematically? If it is, thanks be to God. Because when you have order, method and system, you can get a lot of work done with less effort. But if we're running ragged, we're all over the court, so to speak, we end up by doing things poorly and then we have to do them again. So that's what I would glean from that, uh, that following proverb. Let's move on to another. It says, whoever makes a fortune by a lying tongue is chasing a bubble over deadly snares. Wow, that's interesting. Whoever makes a fortune by a lying tongue is ch chasing a bubble over deadly snares. Just yeah, just imagine that you're, you know, that someone is uh, blowing a bubble and you're walking and you end up by falling into a pit and you end up by breaking your leg. You fall into a swamp and you, you're bit by an alligator. In other words, I think what the what the proverb is saying is this. If if you're a liar, if you're a liar, you might get away with uh, with your lie to a certain degree. But sooner or later, the liar is discovered. Because by telling one lie, often then you have to tell another lie, and then another lie, and then another lie. Before you know, you're wrapped up in so many lies that you don't even know what the truth is. So let's get in the habit, my friends, of thinking before we speak. That's right, to think before we speak. But also uh, to get in the habit of not telling lies. You know, they say in English and Spanish, these, uh, these cliches, well, in Spanish they say, una mentira piedosa, which means a, a pious lie. So look at a pious lie. Or in English we say a white lie. But you know, a lie is a lie. True that there are bigger lies than smaller lies, but we should avoid even telling small lies. Jesus says, he who is faithful in the small will be faithful in the large. Remember um, uh, Charlie Brown, was Char you remember Charlie Brown in the comic strips of Charlie Brown. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them have moral lessons, too. Remember one was um, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown was talking to Lucy. And Lucy said to Charlie Brown that, uh, well, it's only, it's only a white lie, just a white lie. And Charlie Brown responded by saying, why well, do you know that lies come in colors? I didn't know that lies come in colors. You know, it's, I think in small ways we, we can sometimes lie and it's a bad habit and we even give bad example. I'll give you another example. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. Bueno, hello. The little girl answers the phone. Who is it? And she says, La Tia Lupe. I'm your Aunt Lupe. Tia Lupe, what would you like? I want you to speak to mom. So little girl goes to her mother and says, Hey mom, La Tia Lupe wants to talk to you. Tell her I tell her I'm not here. My mommy wanted me to tell you that she said that she's not here now. I can see and hear you laughing through the screen. I can hear you laughing through the screen. And it is it, it is funny. It is funny. But also it's sad at the same time. Because uh, that mother is, num not only is she lying, but she's teaching her little daughter to lie. 
She's giving bad example to her daughter, and she's lying to her sister. Even when you get the telemarketers, I'm sure you get them. You know, you can disconnect your landline if you want, or if you got it, say, is Juan Garcia here? And this is Juan Garcia. No, he's not here. Just say, yes, I'm Juan Garcia, but I don't want anything. Thank you, and God bless you. Now, that person might get angry at you, but uh, why waste your time? But why lie? You know, one lie will generate another lie. It's called the chain effect, or the domino effect. And Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. Sometimes I'll quote Adrian Rogers, who was a very, one of the most famous Baptist preachers for about 40 years. He died about 10 years ago. And he said this. This is strong. He uses sometimes pretty strong language. He says, he says, Jesus says, the devil is the father of lies. Therefore, if we lie, we're the sons and daughters of the devil. Wow. Pretty strong language, isn't it? Pretty strong language. You probably remember when you were a kid, I was brought up and raised on some of the Aesop's, Aesop's fables and the stories. Those were the 50, 60 years ago. We were brought up and raised more in the literary world with a lot of storytelling. One of the first uh, stories I heard was the boy that cried wolf. So there he is in the marketplace and cries out, Wolf! 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 And the men come in, running to try to save the little child. Where's the wolf? Just joking. Following day, Wolf! 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 Men come running in. Where's the wolf? Just joking. Following day, the wolf comes in. The boy cries out, Wolf! And the men say, That boy's a liar. And the wolf eats the boy up. <laughs> I like the story. Because if you keep telling lies, no one's going to believe you. They're just going to believe that kid is a chronic liar. Coming from a big family of nine, my parents didn't have too many rules. Too many rules uh, would would they wouldn't be observed. They would have basic rules that they really insisted upon. Two of the rules were uh, obey authority. When mom and dad said something that was God speaking, we had to obey mom and dad. Actually, the fourth commandment. Another thing that they insisted upon is uh, teaching us not to pray. I'm, I'm sorry, not to pray not to lie. And one of the reasons why is if in the family everyone is a liar, you can't trust anyone. There's no trust, there's no confidence, you're always second guessing if the person is telling the truth or not. And all, not all the family members can walk, or walk around with a lie detector around his wrist. We can't do that. So the proverb insists that uh, we should not um, we shouldn't tell lies lies uh, will always will sooner or later be discovered but also if we live in the presence of God if we live in the presence of God then God sees and hears everything 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 we say everything we do even everything we think is an open book before God. It's like the sun beaming down on us on midday. God sees, hears everything. Therefore, living in the presence of God is a very efficacious tool to grow in our life of holiness. So let's move on. These Proverbs are great, aren't they? These Proverbs are very good. 
very practical, very helpful. You might even spend some time by reading the whole book of Proverbs. We're just giving you a smattering, uh, just a little, a little uh, taste of these Proverbs the church gives us. Probably hoping that we'll want to read all of them. So let's move on. The soul of the wicked man desires evil. His neighbor finds no pity. His neighbor finds no pity in his eyes. The soul of the wicked man desires evil. My friends, we should desire the exact opposite. We should desire, my friends, we should desire, my friends, only that which is good. Desire only that which is good. And good actions, good actions follow from good intentions. Good intentions often follow from good thoughts. My father would often say, the thought is the father of the deed. In other words, before we carry out an action, we've already planned it in our mind, in our hearts. So let's purify our hearts of any wicked or evil desires. And ask God to give us a new heart. A noble heart, a pure heart, a generous heart. A heart that's willing to sacrifice for God and for, love, for the love of souls. What about the next proverb? When the arrogant man is punished, the simple are the wiser. When the wise man is instructed, he gains knowledge. Let's uh, focus upon that last one. When the wise man is instructed, he gains knowledge. I'd like to talk briefly about that. Yesterday at 4 o'clock, I gave a, a good hour talk to about 100, 100 parents. Then the evening I gave another talk to a group of parents. Why am I doing this? Well, years ago, probably about 20 years ago, there was a Father Velasquez who presented to Cardinal Mahoney and the bishop and the priests his program, which is family catechesis. What he insisted upon was the importance of the whole family becoming involved in catechesis. So I went to visit this Father Velasquez, who was in uh, St. Rose of Lima, where Father Dario is right now. I visited him a couple of times, and I really liked the idea. And at least the past, I'd say the past 20 years almost, when children and teenagers come in for catechism, I take the initiative to teach the parents. And I honestly believe, my friends, speaking on a, speaking on a more uh, pat, uh, wide basis, one of the, I think one of the biggest fallacies in the church is the following, that we dedicate two hours to the children that they can make their first communion. We dedicate two years to the confirmation students, the teenagers. So two years and two years. But what about the parents? What about the parents? Many of the parents have not had any formation since they made their first communion, and maybe their parents are 50 years old. 
So for more than 40 years, the parents haven't, have not had any formation whatsoever. None whatsoever. So, I, I rejoice in being able to spend a lot of time and effort teaching the confirmation students in the afternoon, but also teaching the parents. And I repeat to the parents that you are the first teachers of your children. I'm your teacher. We want to work together to save our children, to save our teenagers. That's why the proverb man mentions that the wise man is instructed. He gains knowledge. The wise man is instructed. He gains knowledge. What the Word of God is really saying is that the wise man is the one who knows that he does not know all of it. An arrogant man will think that he knows everything. He's a know-it-all. That's why it's so very important for us as adults to take seriously our ongoing formation. That we keep working on growing in knowledge and wisdom, in that which pertains to our religion and our spiritual life. And then we share that with others. Pope John Paul II, St. Pope John Paul II says that one of the best ways for us to grow in our faith is to share our faith with others. So even right now, I feel that I'm growing in my faith because I'm sharing my faith with you with you. And hopefully you'll be able to share maybe this talk to others or what you've learned, you can share this with others. Let's, Jesus says, go out to the whole world. Teach them all I taught you. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and I'll be with you always, even until the end of the world. That's right. These Proverbs are are spiritual gems, aren't they? Let's move on. The next one is the just man appraises the house of the wicked. There's one who brings down the wicked to ruin. The wicked man, my friends, may prosper in this life. It may happen that the wicked man may prosper in this life. And it sometimes happens that good people, good people, honest people, hardworking people, will sometimes complain saying, you know, me and my wife, we've worked hard all of our years and we can barely pay the rent. Whereas our neighbor has so many benefits. He's got a new car, got a good job, uh, uh, a bank account overflowing with money. Why is that happening? Well, you know, it could happen because God is allowing you to carry the cross this life so that you can rejoice forever in heaven. But those who do evil, they may not be discovered always during this life, but when they die, they have to go before the judgment seat of Christ. That's true. They die, they have to go before the judgment seat of Christ. Everything will be, everything will be brought into the light. And God will judge. He will judge the good and he will judge the evil. In other words, what we sow, we're going to reap. And the book of Hebrews says, we have one life to live and then judgment comes. Hebrews chapter 8. We only have one life to live and then judgment comes. The Proverbs are, are strong. Let's move on. He who shuts his eyes, he who shuts his eyes to the cry of the poor, will himself 
also call and not be heard. My friends, let's be attentive to the cry of the poor, not to be deaf to their cry. How can we help out the poor? Well, you might even go to Matthew chapter 25 and just go through Matthew chapter 25. You've got most of the corporal works of mercy. I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a foreigner and you welcomed me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. When? Whenever you did it to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. Those are the corporal works of mercy. We're going to be judged on how we treat others. I'd like to give an example that I had in the parish. We have a poor program where we give bags of food to the poor once a week. They're bagged on Monday and Tuesday. We have a really good system. We help out the poor families by giving them a bag of food. Years ago, I was involved in this for many years. And I would give the spiritual part. I would bring the uh, most of our mothers into the church and I would pray with them, I would sing with them, then I'd give them I'd give them a long homily. I repeat, give them a long homily. Sometimes 20, 25 minutes. And they were patiently waiting for me to give them their little card so they could get their bag of food. Patiently putting up with Father Broom. Because there was a combination of I was giving them the spiritual, and the others would give them the bag of food. You know, Pope Francis in The Joy of the Gospel makes this comment. Too often it happens that we provide for the material needs of the person, but we neglect the spiritual. So we had a harmonious blend of me giving the spiritual, and then they would... Uh, the group of workers would give them the bag of food. <clears throat> but I'd like to tell you an interesting anecdote that happened to me a good 20 years ago. The food had already been given to the people. And this mother came with about four or five kids. And she said, oh, we're short food. Can you provide us with some food? And they looked and there were no bags left. Old Mother Hubbard, there was not a bone in the cupboard. Remember that? Old Mother Hubbard, not a bone in the cupboard. Hey, remember those, those Aesop proverbs that we learned in the past. So I decided that I would take her to, um, across the street there was a supermarket called Max Food. Uh, it's no longer there, but it was a, um, it was like a, Food for food for less. So I told, okay, well, I'll meet you over there, and I'll I'll be able to, uh, I'll, I'll 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 buy your your groceries for you. So we went over there, and uh, she went and started to uh, get her her food, and she put a couple of bags on the conveyor belt. And then uh, I said to the uh, cashier that I would pay for it. I pulled out my wallet, and I didn't have enough money to pay for it. And I was so embarrassed. I, my, my face was turning the color of those uh, red tomatoes that she had had. I was embarrassed. So what happened was uh, a man behind me saw that I was fumbling to try to pay for this woman's food. And the man said, don't worry, Father, I'll pay for it. He paid for the whole 
bag, the, the whole bags of food that the woman had. Following day, following day, I was preaching on this. He said to people, there was a poor woman, I tried to pay for a grocery, I, I couldn't, but the poor, the man behind me volunteered to pay for it. And I just pulled out, showed my, my, um, my wallet, which was falling apart and didn't have too much money in it. Following day, someone knocked at the door of the sacristy in the old church where we had the mass, said, Father, I have a gift for you. He gave me a new wallet and they opened up, there's a hundred dollars in the wallet. So I'd like to tell that story. I like to tell that story because um, it's uh, it's a story that humbles me because of my lack of foresight. I had goodwill, but not 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 enough common sense or economic knowledge to understand that. Hey, hey, pal, if you're going to pay for the grocery, you have to have enough money in your wallet. I didn't have it, but we just see how how good God is. How he intervened by the man paying for the groceries in the supermarket, and then the man after the mass giving me a new wallet and a hundred bucks in the wallet. So I think what I'm really saying is that God cannot be God cannot be outdone in generosity. And I'm trying to I'm trying to explain these proverbs by means of stories. He who shuts his ear to the cry of the poor, will himself also call and not be heard. In other words, God will not hear him. I think we have to form the habit of trusting, trusting my friends, trusting in, in, in divine providence, trusting in divine providence. God will provide. God will provide. So these proverbs are very powerful. I'd like to tell you another story of uh, divine providence. And um, this uh, this biblical passage can help us out. Because a lot of us worry. We worry about the past. We worry about the future. And consequently, we don't live the sacrament, the present moment. Saint Joseph Cotolenio. He was a saint that lived at the time of John Bosco in Turin, Italy. And he was an extraordinary man that established what is called La Piccola Casa, the small house. The Piccola Casa was like a city that was built to help out the poor. The poor and the handicapped. And he actually formed a convent of blind contemplative nuns. I never forgot that because I went up as a seminarian to Turin to visit with the other seminarians, uh, Turin and La Pica La Casa, the House of Divine Providence. So what happened was he set up this, <clears throat> like a little city, which was designed to help out the poor without any economic funds. So it would just run on the donations that were given to him every day. And often he was in the red, but he had so much trust in divine providence, so much trust. So here's the story I'd like to tell you. He had a huge debt, and he told one of his workers, uh, was a woman, to go and to get, go to the bakery, and to get the bread for the poor people for the day. Remember the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. So the woman said, yes, Father, but give me the money so I can buy the bread from the baker. And Father 
Giuseppe, Father Joseph, said, I don't have any money. Just go, go get the bread. So the woman was befuddled. How am I going to get the bread if I don't have any money? That means I'm going to have to steal the bread. He said, no, no, no. Go and God will provide. So the woman is heading toward, she's heading toward the, uh, the to the bakery. And she's kind of scratching her head. How am, how on earth am I going to get the money to be able to provide for the poor? But on the way there, something happened. A beautiful, majestic woman stops the woman and says, Where are you going? The woman says, I think I'm going to the bakery to get bread for Father Giuseppe, Father Joseph, to, so he can distribute the food to the poor. But I don't have any money. The woman said, You don't have any money? No. The woman said, Stretch out your hands. She gave her this big uh, bag and then the beautiful majestic woman disappeared so the woman opened up the bag and there was a lot of money and it was enough money to pay the debt for the day which was pretty big and to pay for enough bread for that day give us this day our daily bread by the way the name of that majestic woman was MDP, Mother of Divine Providence. MDP, Mother of Divine Providence. Mother of Divine Providence. In other words, it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now I had the privilege, my friends, after graduating from the university, I was a teacher for a year in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. And the name of the parish, parish school where, where I taught was Mother of Divine Providence. MDP, Mother of Divine Providence. So, maybe that's what God is challenging us to do today. I think a lot of us are assaulted by a lot of worries. Worries about the past, worries about the future, Assaulted by worries in the present moment. Let's try to trust. Let's entrust our cares to the Lord. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says it over and over again. He says, Jesus says, don't worry. 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 And Jesus says, look at, look at the birds of the air. Look at the flowers of the field. Have you ever seen a bird flying to a psychologist? Have you? To get a, get a, a new prescription? I doubt it. I doubt it. Have you ever seen a, a flower going to the beauty parlor? I really doubt it. So if God, prov God provides for the birds of the air, and God provides for the lilies of the field, will not God provide for you, man and woman of little faith? Jesus goes on to say, don't worry, about, don't worry about what you're going to eat. The pagans worry about that. Do not worry about what you're going to wear. The pagans worry about that. And here's the clincher. Here's the clincher. The clincher is this. Seek, seek first, not second. Seek first. These are the words of Christ. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be given to you besides. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be given to you besides. 
And this can be a prayer you say during the course of the day. And that prayer is, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. If God is with us, who can be against us? If God is with us, who can be against us? And the psalm, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So my friends, we've had a wonderful conversation this morning. And I really love these proverbs. These proverbs are very, very rich, aren't they? Proverbs are very, very rich. You might go through these Proverbs and the Magnificat and see which of those Proverbs that we've gone through today, we've gone through about five or six of them, which of these Proverbs seems to speak most to your heart, to your life? And may God bless you. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.